Taste the nectar regarded as a latter-day Viagra now in Journey into Wine. I think that great wine tells you everything you need to know about a place and my favourites come from passionate winemakers who pour their heart and soul into the bottle. I'm on the hunt for weird and wonderful grape varieties that make truly astonishing wines. My journey is taking me to a region with some of the oldest winemaking traditions in the world. With around 3,000 years of practice, it's not surprising that New Europe is producing some cracking wines. But it's not all been plain sailing for Central and Eastern European countries. Under communism, quality wine all but disappeared and cheap blanc was produced in bulk. This part of my journey takes me east to Bulgaria, a country whose ancient people, the Thracians, have been making wine for thousands of years. I am starting in Melnik, home to one of Winston Churchill's favorite wines, then heading east via Plovdiv. Eating in Bulgaria is an assault on the senses. Rich, meaty flavors, smoky, tarry cigarettes, and a good dollop of coffee. It's not surprising that the locals need a very powerful wine to stand up to all of this. And many of us will have had the opportunity to try some. Bulgaria was the second largest exporter of bottled wines after France. They have been at it for centuries. They even sold wine to the ancient Greeks. But these exports to Hermione's cronies amounted to child's play when compared with what was to come. Under communism, Bulgaria continued to roll out its cheap cabernets with the force of a Russian tank. Behind the venture was Bulgaria's state-run wine company, Vinprom. Vinprom cared about quantity, not quality, and even swapped its vino with the states in exchange for a real taste of capitalism, Pepsi Cola. I'm meeting winemaker Ogi Svetanov, who worked in the industry at the time. Back in the time when the industry was uh, run by the state-owned wine and spirits monopoly. At a certain stage in the mid of 80s, the total production of grapes reached 650,000 tons. It's an enormous amount of grapes, but unfortunately all these grapes were turned into wine that was supposed to, to reach the shelves of the then East, Eastern Bloc. But the then market needed mostly bulk wines and cheap wines and Bulgarian wine industry managed by the then state monopoly just grabbed the opportunity. This was one of the reasons why Bulgarian wine lost its identity. So I don't understand why there was this exchange of Pepsi Cola concentrate with Bulgarian wine. Because the then communist state in Bulgaria wanted to offer the citizens a bit of Western life they obviously offered a barter deal to different companies, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Pepsi-Cola agreed. So the Bulgarian government started trading uh, Bulgarian wine for Pepsi-Cola concentrate. It sounds like Bulgarian wine lost its soul. What do you think can be done now? As in one case, we showed that truly big wines can successfully be made in Bulgaria. What I think is that to regain popularity uh, for Bulgaria, it's absolutely and vital necessary 
to achieve its own identity. And that's exactly what Oggy's done with his wine. It's really fresh, it's really vibrant, it's really complex, it's really, really nice. Thanks to its early 80s boom, Bulgarian wine became synonymous with candid, cut-rate capsaves. But I want to go native, so I'm off to Melnik in the southwest. Bordered by the Perin Mountains, these sandy soils are home not only to Spartacus, the rebel slave of old, but also to a punchy southern varietal rooted on the Greek border. Melnick's wines have been celebrated for over 600 years and in fact, it was one of Winston Churchill's favourite drops. He's said to have drunk about 500 litres of the stuff a year. And look at this, the legend is still around today. The local grape variety, broadleafed Melnick, dates back to Thracian times, some 6,000 years ago. I'm travelling to the historic Rosen Monastery to visit a vine that's not quite that old but still rates as a senior citizen. A 300-year-old vine like this one is incredibly rare because at the end of the 19th century, a laos called phylloxera wiped out the entire European vineyards. All the vineyards are perfect to make great wines because by themselves, they naturally achieve balance and produce small quantities of very concentrated grapes. And that's not the end of the rich wine heritage. Kordopulov House, built by a local wine merchant in 1754, is a living shrine to wine. These cellars are 180 meters long and used to store 300 tons of wines. Well wishers come here and stick a coin in the wall, hoping for lots of rain and a great harvest. So it seems a bit rude not to do the same. With such a distinguished pedigree, you might expect a bottle of Melnick to cost the earth, but good wine doesn't always have to be pricey. Now be careful, there are two Melnicks. The Broadleaf, an ancient grape variety believed to date back to Thracian times, and Melnick 55, a commie creation because the real Melnick was believed to be too much hard work. I personally prefer the real McCoy because I find Melnick 55 a bit boring. This little number is very feisty and it oozes tobacco leaf and sour cherry, which is the classic note for a good Melnick. Mm. And guess how much it is? A whopping one euro fifty a bottle. area you'd be forgiven for thinking that the only tipple available is red wine. You'd be wrong. If you want to drink like a local then you need to try rakia. With around 60% alcohol it's like grape flavored rocket fuel and is usually served as an aperitif. I'm off to a Melnick distillery with a local guide to try some. Well I'm gonna try your aperitif. Okay. This is 60. 57 degrees. Yes. Exactly. <coughs> oh. It's good, but <coughs> it's very strong. Много е хубаво, но е много силно. Много силно, да. Тя трябва да отлежи в известно време. Да, че придобива така. It's very strong, yes. It should grow up a little bit for some time. So we never drink just made rakia. Is it good? It's good? Yes, yeah. of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Oh, wow. oh. <laughs> Thank you.
On my quest for indigenous Bulgarian grape varieties, I'm heading east across the mountains to my first winery, Little Star. A lot of Bulgarian vineyards are planted with international grape varieties like Merlot, but Little Star have started to experiment with local ones. Vassal Petrov Rashkov, a UK wine merchant specializing in Bulgarian wine, recommended this place, and we're going to taste their unusual rosé made from a grape called Pamid. Bulgaria produces a lot of wines. We have 150 wineries. There are so many different uh, styles of wine. Not that many different grape varieties. When you think about it, wine has been here for centuries, centuries and centuries. Take a look at Greece, take a look at Portugal. How many indigenous grape varieties do they have? Where are ours? So I, I went on that crusade to try and find wines which will make me proud being a fine wine merchant and being Bulgarian. So how do you think that Bulgarian wines are progressing? The Bulgarians have discovered finally, thanks God for that, that the good wine is made in the vineyard. Maybe they always knew it, but they were trying by... Because uh, Bulgaria is infatuated by technology. And, and they kind of uh, lied to themselves that they can do wonders in the winery. They believed in that. They believed in investing in technology to make the poor grapes good wine. It didn't happen. And, and, and there came that revolution. I think it came about this 2008 now, probably 2003, 2004, where, when everybody uh, kind of understood they are not Jesus Christ, could not turn water into wine, and they have to invest in vineyards. So let's try this. I mean, we're talking about indigenous grape varieties, and this is a pamid which is a very unusual grape variety, but it's indigenous to Bulgaria. It is indeed. Uh, in fact, uh, at some point, Pamit was one of the most planted red grape varieties. Generally, I'm not a big rosé fan, but when I find a new rosé, it's exciting because perhaps, you know, this is going to change my mind. Well, I'm very much hoping that this is going to be the rosé to turn your <laughs> perception of rosé upside down. You know, it is a really interesting rosé. You get these rose hips aroma, there's a slight foxiness about, about these rosé. And on top of it, there's tannins, which add structure and makes it more interesting than a lot of very bland, soft, juicy rosés. For me, it carries the message that if you're making wine, you have to make it with your heart and soul. Well, thank you very much for, you know, showing me a, a new grape, new aromas, new winery. It's a pleasure. The journey is taking me to Central and Eastern Europe to explore the phenomenal changes taking place in the wine world. Bulgaria has been making wine for thousands of years. I'm in Plovdiv, in the southwestern part of the country, home to the Romans and before that to the Thracian tribe, one of the oldest winemaking people in the world. were an ancient tribe who quite simply loved wine. They introduced the Romans to the worship of Dionysus, or Bacchus, the god of wine. In spring, Bacchanalian orgies would have been conducted to celebrate this god. Now it seems to me that these orgies were a bit of an excuse to get drunk on sweet, sickly wine drunk from animal horns. Believe it or not, this practice still exists today, and once a year, people climb up a hill, get drunk, and then try to find their own way back down again. I'm a bit of a billionaire, mate, but I would do anything in the name of research. The Thracians knew that Bulgaria had a great climate and soil for making wine and since the collapse of communism, overseas investors have flocked to the country to follow in their footsteps. 
I'm headed out of Plovdiv to the Bessa Valley Winery to meet a French flying winemaker, Mark Dawkin, who chose this corner of Bulgaria to make international styles of wines. And it's been a great success. What puzzles me is that you could be anywhere in the world, but you chose Bulgaria. Uh, I don't know if I chose Bulgaria or if it Bulgaria chose me, but uh, it's true that uh, here there's a combination of a, uh, a very old, very, very old uh, wine country, more than 4,000 years before Jesus Christ, and a climate that is very suitable, and the soils and terroir, and uh, we are also quite lucky to find uh, this place here, but um, I really think that Bulgaria is, uh, is one of the next Eldorado in the world. We knew that it was the the place, really. In Bulgaria, each small plot can have dozens of owners, and I wondered if Mark had faced problems buying such a large amount of land here. Oh, <laughs> very difficult. We bought the land with 1,700 owners. <laughs> Only. <laughs> Only. And uh, so sometimes uh, to the notary office they were queues and uh, 60, 70 people for one hectare, you know, it's, uh, that was very funny. Uh, it took us approximately two years. So what was it like for the community? Uh, the old people of the village of Agnanovo were crying because uh, they haven't been seeing any vineyard there since uh, the beginning of the 70s because it was abandoned com completely. And you've been really successful abroad. You've helped raise the image of Bulgaria. Then abroad, yes, it, it, it has started a few years ago, first by England, by the way, uh, because we are uh, on the way through the shelves for more than three years now. Am I right that you're the most expensive Bulgarian wine available in the UK, for example? Uh, it has been like a shock for the <laughs> English consumers to find a uh, 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 wine so expensive, Bulgarian wine, sorry, so expensive. But we have been still with this price, we have been successful. I guess it's inside the wine. Well, I for one love your wine, so let's get into it right now. Please. Do the pouring. Thank you. So this is the Enira Reserva, that is our uh, first quality wine. And it's uh, mainly made of uh, Merlot. It's mm -hmm. approximately 70%. Uh, we have 20% uh, Syrah. And in this uh, specific vintage, 10% uh, 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 um, Cabernet Sauvignon. The reason I, I, love, I love this wine is because I put my nose in here and it really reminds me of um, Mediterranean sort of styles of wines, baked f uh, flavors, it's very, very spicy, but then a really great structure. So, uh, you know, wine built to last, but with lots of personality. So it's basically, for me, it reminds me of like Bordeaux with lots of sunshine. That's what this <laughs> That's wine tastes like. That might be a good definition, yes. <laughs> we have tried to make kind of Bordeaux in Bulgaria. Maybe it's not maybe, um, what you said, it's a southern Bordeaux or Bordeaux with sunshine. Um, we prefer to respect the Bulgarian mm. soils with the Bordeaux winemaking. Mm. Well, it's totally delicious. And as we yeah. say in Bulgaria, Nazdrave, which is... Nazdrave. Yeah. Miss Cheers, Nazdrave. Bulgaria makes some of the best yogurts I've ever tasted and it's in lots of dishes. But it's famously difficult to match with wine because of its creaminess and its delicate yet sour flavours are very easily overpowered. Which is probably why the locals use rakia, which is a strong but neutral spirit. My tip for this yogurt salad is a fresh, crisp, light-bodied white wine like this Sauvignon Blanc, which cuts through the creaminess and enhances the dish. The next stage of my journey is taking me east of Plovdiv to meet a producer who is just starting out on a new project. Atanas Tashkov first planted vines here in February 07, 
and along with the international grape varieties so many people grow here, he's been brave enough to make a wine from a local grape called Mavrut. When he bought this land, he didn't know whether or not it would be great for vineyards, but he had a hunch, and his hunch has definitely paid off. I'm in for a treat. And the reason I came to see you is because I tasted lots of Mavrut and I particularly love yours. So I thought, ah, I've got to come and, and, and meet up with you. Um, but on these vineyards, there's no Mavrut yet. Then, no, in these uh, vineyards don't have plants. And uh, in this area, uh, we work and put four or five uh, hectare Mavrut. Because Mavrut is our type grape. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is great, uh, Mavrut, um, Merlot is great, Syrah uh, in this uh, part is, is great, but Mavrut is great for our region. And is it difficult to grow Mavrut? Absolutely difficult. In my first project, uh, when we make uh, Mavrut, 18% uh, uh, harvest uh, Mavrut we put in the land. Ah, so Mavrut has naturally very high yields. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. So you have got to tame it so it only produces a little bit yes. to make good wine. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Well, shall we try it? Absolutely. Yes. The amazing thing with Mavrut is that. You, you know, the name implies like a really big wine, but in fact, you taste it and A, you know, the colour is very light and secondly, it's actually a very delicate wine. I mean, it's, you know, more medium bodied and it's very full of like lots of cherries, but great perfume. And that's what I love about it is that you taste it and there's just like this, you know, mouth-watering perfume coming out of it. My ph philosophy for a winemaker, for, for making wine, mm. Is, uh, is that I make wine for drinking, mm. not for museum, not for uh, magazine. That I drink for, uh, for, I make for drinking. And I'm very, very happy uh, when um, people who, who drink my wine uh, enjoy. But this is really nice. It's yeah. balanced. I think yeah. it's very, very balanced. Yes, thank well, listen, you. Thank, thank you. you so much for bringing, you. bringing me up here and also, you know, I'll have to come back once you've planted your Mavrut and I can taste the Mavrut from Abs here. Absolutely. So, here, here's to the future baby Mavrut. <laughs> Bulgaria is truly blessed. Centuries of know-how, a great climate and soil, and a rich mix of indigenous and international grape varieties. In fact, the wines are bound to go from strength to strength. When I visit a wine region, I seek out stuff I would not find back home because that's the real wine adventure. Athanasis Mavrut has it all. It's well made, it's indigenous, it's got bags of personality, and most of all, it's Bulgarian. If you want to know more about anything featured in the program or you're planning your own wine journey, then log on to our website.